Right. So, three, two, one. Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic show this week and WordPress and SAS. This is episode 711. We've got a great guest. I've been pumped up. I think it's going to be one of our one of our best interviews this year. Oh, well, I'm just putting a little bit of pressure on our guest. Um, serious uh, pressure. Yeah, serious pressure. You are used to it, David. We've got David Seagull, the CEO of Meetup, with us. We're going to be talking about all things about leadership, his experience with dealing with Meetup, and a few other interesting people that he's had the pleasure of working with and dealing with. Um, so, David, um, can you give us a quick 10, 15 seconds intro? Sure. Name is David Siegel. I am the CEO of Meetup. Meetup is the world's largest platform for finding and building community. And I happen to have also just written a book called Decide and Conquer, 44 Decisions That Make or Break All Leaders. That was probably nine seconds, so hopefully I stayed within time. Yeah, that's great. And I've got my co-host, the Andrew Palmer. The Andrew Palmer from thisisandrewpalmer.com and co-founder of coofbertha.ai. And we're just in a collaboration, a really exciting collaboration with Yoast. So go to yoast.com or bertha.ai and you'll find out what we're doing. And it's great. Right, that's fantastic. Um, before we go into this great interview, I've got a couple of messages from our major sponsors. We'll be back in a few moments. We're coming back. I just want to point out that we've got some great special offers from our sponsors, plus some great recommendations of plugin services for WordPress and SaaS. To get all these goodies, just go over to WPTonic slash recommendations and they're all listed out there my tribe so David, um we've had a pandemic probably good news in some ways for me tough or not um probably not because the load of meetups were cancelled so it's probably been interesting times that meet up um what have been some over the past two to three years what have been some of the biggest challenges you faced at meetup and have you got any advice or insights about how you dealt with them only a minor question david that's a great start of course absolutely let's do it so meetup was virtually 100 percent irl or in real life or in person for its first 18 years of existence. In fact, the number one reason why we turned down a meetup organizer and we have turned down millions, if not tens of millions of dollars because we were so focused on in-person, in-person, in-person. Well, in February 2020, we started seeing almost all of our events get canceled in China. Meetup is in 193 different countries. So I saw China, like 95% cancellations just overnight in February. Like, oh, maybe this is thing like SARS or something else is going to stay in Asia. It's not going to you know, move anywhere else. And then we start seeing in Northern Italy, every single event get canceled. Every RSVP gets canceled. We're like, hmm, this didn't happen when SARS, you know, happened, you know, years ago. But it's not going to happen in the United States. Of course not. We never have pandemics in the United States. It's been 100 years since the last big one. Of course it happened. Early March, a Meetup employee was actually one of the first people in all of New York City to get COVID. We vacated our... Our, um, I was at a conference with him, actually. I didn't get COVID. He did. It was like late February, which is quite early in New York. Um, we vacated our office, which is the time was in a WeWork building. There were all these articles about how WeWork has COVID, Meetup has COVID. All of our events were in person. And we were also in the middle of a sale process of selling the company out of WeWork. And wow. yeah. And um, we got, I got everyone together and I said, Meetup, after 18 years, could go under. Let's talk about what we need to do because everything was falling apart and we were about to sell the company, as I mentioned. All of our investors, all the potential people who are going to acquire the company also pulled out because of the pandemic. And I got them together and I said, what are we about? What is our mission? Is our mission about IRL in real life or is our mission about connections? Is our mission about building connections? And people who have been here for a long time said, we can't do virtual meetup groups. That would be terrible. That's against our entire mission. In fact, our founder, Scott Heiferman, one time at a big WeWork um, conference, stood up with a 
axe and started uh, and started smashing a AR device um, because he said, we will never do anything virtual. I made the decision. I said, stop everything that you're doing. We're enabling virtual groups, making virtual events. In the pandemic, we have now had, this is pretty insane, over three and a half million virtual events at Meetup. Over 30, 35 million people have participated multiple times in those virtual events and also 190 different countries in the world. And it's the best thing we could have done. And, you know, crisis sometimes is the best form of innovation. We never would have prioritized virtual events. But now, if you are living in Kansas City and you want to learn Swahili, and we only have Swahili learning groups in, you know, 15 different cities around the world, well, now you can learn it. Now you can join a group in Montreal that's teaching Swahili. Yeah, just a, just a quick follow-through question. You know, that sounds great, but how... How did you actually do it? Because hey, you've got to build a bloody platform and you've got to have developers and you've got to assemble a team and you've got to have a plan and you've got to get done ASP. And how did you do it? So every you leader know? always has to ask the question of, do you build, do you buy, or do you partner? And our answer was, we're not going to build a whole new video conferencing platform. That doesn't make sense. Instead, we're going to partner with and integrate with as many different video conferencing platforms as possible. So we're integrated with the Zoom. We've, we've actually had over, I think, 100 to 200 different video conferencing platforms um, have been used for different meetup events. And we, we enabled those integrations. We enabled those type of, types, of, types of work to be done. We dealt with, dealt with different standard time that people are in different locations and different time zones, the different places. Yeah. Um, and it's worked out, it's worked out, you know, swimmingly well, shall we say. Oh, well, uh, over to you, Andrew. Oh, it's incre I mean, it's incredible that you've, you had to not pivot, you had to spin, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> you're, you're More than a pivot. Whirling dervishes in the office and, and that, and also it's not about just, and I have got a question, but it's just, it's not just about pivoting or spinning or whatever. It's handling the um emotions of everybody that works for meetup and mm. saying what what and especially their their um their morals of saying no we're we're in real life we can't do this it doesn't matter whether we go bust we're going against our 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 standards so you know kudos for handling that but so a lot of people listening and watching and i am not one of them i didn't realize that you were um part or, or we work owned you up until now you know because i'm an idiot but um so, you know, Adam Newman, a little bit of things going on with that and WeWork and nightmares and property uh -huh. and things and going on. Um, so he hired you. So, you know, the, the sandal wearing person or the barefoot wearing person and uh, the visionary, because I'm sure he was a visionary. You know, when you're when you're doing stuff like that, you need to have a little bit of vision. Um, what was it like working with him? Yeah. So, um when I was contacted by a board member of WeWork, um, a guy named Michael Eisenberg, he said, David, I want to introduce you to Adam Newman. Um, he was a investor at a company called Seeking Alpha that was the president of Seeking Alpha. I was the CEO of Investopedia prior to this and we sold Investopedia. He contacted me and he asked me if I was interested in WeWork and Meetup. And I said, oh my God, beyond interested in, in Meetup, love to meet Adam. We met and it was everything you'd expect. It was an insane meeting. It was all over the place. It was each of us standing on tables at different times. Um, it was just, you know, big vegan meal, um, you know, the, the whole nine yards. Uh, you know, he liked me the first meeting. And then he's like, I like David, but I need to meet with him a second time. And I knew I had to do something kind of crazy because people tend to like people who are similar to themselves. And since Adam's, sure. you know, crazy, he likes interviewing and meeting people who are also crazy. So I walked into the office and, and I and I saw that someone I was wearing my like white nice button down shirt and jeans. And I saw someone was wearing a t-shirt that said Meetup plus WeWork. I'm like, oh my God, just literally just walked right past me. And and I walked over to him and I said, I need to get your t-shirt. Can we trade shirts? I have a hundred dollar white Brooks Brothers shirt. You have a raggedy, you know, old t-shirt. Can I, can I switch shirts? So we went to the supply closet. We switched shirts. I walked into the interview with Adam. And I'm like, Adam, I'm already a part of Meetup. I'm already a part of WeWork. Look, I'm here. I'm ready to start. 
and he just started cracking up. And he's like, well, if you right. convince someone to take the shirt off of someone's back, you're my kind of guy. And then, you know, 27 interviews later, because it was a whole long process to get hired within WeWork, I was taking over for the first time founder of a of, of meetup. Um, they had barely just told the, the Scott Heiferman, who was the founder, that, that, that um, they needed to look for a new CEO. Um, and it was a three month process, probably spent four to 500 hours and different meetings and preparations for meetings. And, uh, it all worked out at the end. And how does that, I mean, how does that compare to previous career moves that you made of, of, of interviewing process and everything? Cause you're quite, quite high level, you know, meetups yeah. got, you know, you've done millions of stuff though. I expect there's millions of pounds of, or dollars rather of turnover. I'm in the UK yeah. by the way, sorry. I think in pounds. Uh, I, I, um, pounds and turnover. I got it. And lots and lots of staff, lots of HR issues, lots of you know, lots of lots of stuff going on. You know, how did how does that interview process or that getting that job process compare to, to what it was before? Yeah, well, like they, like they say, um, just like dating is a good way to know whether or not someone is going to be the right fit for marriage, interviewing is dating, um, sure. and it's a good way to learn about you know what the company is going to be like. And because the interview process was so F up and disorganized and chaotic and 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 just very operationally inefficient. I knew that WeWork was going to be kind of hell. I knew it was going to be the hardest job I've ever had in my life. Uh, I, I knew that I was going into a situation where I would learn a tremendous amount and also be under a lot of stress. Um, it was so crazy that I decided to write a book about that whole experience of becoming a you know a, a, a CEO under WeWork and and living in the we crashed kind of kind of world. Sure. Um, so it, I, I knew it would be tough. I remember saying to my wife, I said, if I take this job, uh, I'm going to be like in a tough place for the next six, six months. I was wrong. It was actually three years, but, but things David, are great now. But David, yeah. David, was the, is there a moment in your experience with Adam and his beloved wife that you realized We've jumped the shark here, you know. Was is there a moment that comes to your mind that you realise? Because there's always, you know, I've found really, really bright, really, really, really bright people that they tend to be a little bit weird. But there's there's just a a point where you know they've just lost it, you know. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Is there is there yeah. is there a time where you, you just twig? No, I got what, I got what? into a disagreement with Adam um, about something. Uh, specifically, he wanted me to fly for six hours from New York to San Francisco um, at one o'clock in the morning. You know, starting arriving at seven a.m. to figure out the entire strategy for for meet up on the on the on the airplane. And I and I said to Adam, like that doesn't work for me. A, I have a really important doctor appointment for my kid, you know, that next day, and I can't cancel that. Um, and B, um, I'm not going to develop strategy on a plane with you. That's just not the way I do things. And uh, and he said, no, 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 you're going to do it. I said, no, no, I'm, no, I'm not. It's not going to happen. Sure. Um, and he said, I was the first person that ever kind of turned him down and rejected um, going to uh, on a plane with him. Um, he then said to me, um, David, you know, Barack Obama if he asked you to go on a plane with him for five or six hours, would you turn Barack Obama down? And I'm like, Adam, frankly, you're not Barack Obama. And, and again, I talked about it and I'll, and I'll tell you, I got to show you something here. Hold on for a sec. We're going to have to do, yeah. So I talked about that, um, you know, in the book. And then I was just in Dublin, Ireland, actually, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. And there was, uh, I spoke at, a, at an event meeting with organizers and an artist came in and he handed me a, a work of art that he made. And, and I just totally surprised me. He made this work of art of a picture of, here we go, of me um, kind of flying a plane for meetup. And on the front of the plane is Adam Newman, you know, flying the plane and, and the side of the plane has a picture of um of we work kind of taken over by meetup so you know and then we never really talked well, adam about newman it. was wearing adam newman had his has his had his mouth taped up on that picture yeah, yeah the he? reason it has mouth was taped this, is a, up this because... is a podcast so we've got to describe that so oh, adam newman right. in, in the pilot uh seat with black tape over mark, you know, marking tape over his face right. you're there holding the plane we work has been crossed out meetups on the top and uh yeah. you're showing you're basically showing who's the who the boss is right 
I didn't do that. The image. Someone else made the image. But yeah, but he, he it's got amusing. it. He got it. And, and the reason the why, description of the story, I think. And the reason why the mouth is taped up is because one of my criteria for taking the job was that Adam wouldn't talk to me for the first three months because I wanted to have full focus on the business and learning the business before sure. I'd have to um, kind of present our strategy or being told what to do. So um, as part of that, I, I said that to him and they agreed to that plan. So that was, that was the reason for the mouth being taped up. So there's a lot of interesting experiences, shall we say. So obviously... No, we've all watched the TV series. Um, we crashed. It, yeah, it's entertainment. But is there, you know, is the essence of Adam what you see on that TV series? Or, yeah. or is there any kind of truth about what you see? Or yeah. is it totally just, you know, art? And, you know, you know the guy. I don't. You saw the TV series. What do you think? Sure. So I have two things to share about that. So number one, which by the TV series, it could be you're referring to the Hulu documentary. There's also a show called We Crash and Apple. There's mm -hmm. also two books called Billion Dollar Loser and The Cult of We. I've seen all those. I've read all those, etc. Two things to share. Number one is um, the actual reality of life under WeWork was actually crazier <laughs> than yeah, the We Crash write, You can write it. <laughs> right? You couldn't write it. Sometimes it the happens. truth is crazier. So an example of that is in the We Crash show, um, they had like a gong that people would hit that said, we work on it. You probably remember that it was a gold gong. So someone who was a C-level executive, they used to take him, pick him up and s use his head to hit the gong, except for when they had to bring him to the emergency room because he was bleeding out of his head you know, from that. Now that wasn't in the show, but it's an example of some craziness that occurred. On the other side, however, I'll tell you that what Adam doesn't get credit for is that is the purity of his intentions. He deeply did not just care about himself. Yes, of course, he cared about himself. Lots of people care about themselves. He also cared about making the world a better place. He cared about building community for people. He cared about changing the way that people work. He cared about building connections and giving motivation, giving a mission to young people. And it's not just BS that he cared. He deeply, deeply, and his wife, Rebecca, deeply cared about, you know, people make fun of elevating the world's consciousness, but whatever that means, he deeply cared about helping people to feel more meaning in their lives and build he didn't community. go about doing it the right way but he deeply did care about that a lot yeah. i get that and i and i think i think it you know the we work meet up physical in real life was a good tie up because you could hire a, a we work room for whatever but the the one thing that i want to it's all right talking about adam but you know that's that's history now the future you built on not going in real life it, because of a situation. Na you know, Mother Nature came to us and said, right, you're, you're all going to be working from home and you're not going to be able to go out for a while. You and your crew had to handle that, transition into that, but they also had to handle the we crashed situation with a new CEO or, you know, a, a kind of newish CEO who wasn't quite as mad as a fish, Right. So how did how did people treat you during the We Crash moment? Because again, We Crash and 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 Meet Up were or um, We Work and Meet Up were gonna part ways mm -hmm. um, because of the financial situation. Everything. So how did that transition? How did you? How, how did people react within Meet Up to that and your customers to that transition happening or not happening? Sure. So I to give a, a quick context. I joined Meet Up in October of 2018. Meetup had required nine months earlier in January 2018. Right. Meetup went then went got put up for sale about a year later. So I had a year to build trust, to build relationships. Uh, and we announced and, and, and all of our employees had WeWork stock. They didn't have Meetup stock. All their equity was in WeWork. So right. that when we watched the 47 billion valuation go to 40 to 30 to 20 to 10 to five, that was every person's money. It was every person's kind of value. And people were oftentimes underpaid because of the fact that they had WeWork stock to compensate sure. for, for that. So that was a tough situation. When I stood up and announced in September of 2019, I stood up and I said, actually, here's what happened. In September, I was told that WeWork is good. That was not going to happen. We work, meet up. WeWork is going to be selling Meetup and a bunch of other companies. I said, great, fine. But just make sure that I have an opportunity to tell our employees before anyone else knows about it because... I'm going to lose crust and credibility if they find out about it from the press. They cannot sure. find out about it from the press. 
I then get a call from uh, a senior, senior executive over at WeWork saying, David, I am so sorry. A Wall Street Journal article is hitting in 30 minutes from now. And in the article, it's going to mention that WeWork is divesting Mita. I'm so sorry that people are going to find out that way. I knew you had told me that that's not the way you wanted it. That's it. So I said, hell no, that's not going to happen. So I quickly got every employee in a meeting together. I called the manager. I said, the manager, get over here right now to our office because we're going to announce this together, not just me. I stood up in front of everyone and I said, I have a major announcement to make. I know this was impromptu. WeWork is officially going to be selling Meetup. The decision has been made. A woman in the back stands up and screams, hallelujah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Freedom. She immediately freedom. they, they exactly. get the freedom. It was freedom. like Braveheart. It was like Braveheart. Yeah. We freedom. need to. Oh, hell are you, you. We need to go for our break, folks. We'll be back in a few moments. We're coming back. I've learned from David. I need to get a gun and <laughs> smack some employees into it. Um, me, me. Yeah. Um, before we go into the. Um, the other part of this interview, um, I've got some great messages from some other sponsors. We'll be back in a few moments. Coming back, the gone episode, that's what I'm going to call this. Uh, um, so, so, so what is it, David? You could have, you could have moved to General Motors or some nice quiet setup and just counted your money. What makes, what's, what makes you want to join these crazy organizations and deal with it all? I suppose your wife asks you that every day as well. <laughs> every day, so what, every day. So what's it? What, what's this about, David? Yeah. Have you got any insight about your own madness? Yeah. So I care about using my time in ways that make the world a better place. Um, there's a you know. You, a, why did you decide to come on this podcast, then, David? That's, I heard. I heard they make the world a better place. That's how oh, it works. Okay. So. Um, I, I deeply am terrified about the loneliness epidemic that exists in this world. 46% of people globally regularly feel lonely, not sometimes, not occasionally, but regularly feel lonely. Among people who are 18 to 25 years old, it's actually 62% regularly feel lonely, whether it's in the UK, whether it's in Australia, whether it's Ireland, whether it's in the US. It's a major problem with loneliness. Meetup is the cure for the loneliness epidemic. We have packed 60 million people in this world and help to build community for people. And for me, it's a reason to deal with the chaos, to deal with the craziness, to deal with the challenges, because I want to spend my life and my time helping to build community for people. Oh, well, there we go. I've got a buy a bead on this. I mean, it's the way it is. What, one of the things I want to know is, and I'm sure the tribe will want to know as well, what's the ratio now of uh, IRL as opposed to uh, online? Yeah, so it's been super fascinating. So, for example, in the middle of the pandemic in the United States, um, in Texas and Florida, Florida, where you know apparently COVID never hit in certain states in the United States, and people were just unmasked right throughout. It was like eighty percent in person. You know, even the the craziest amount. You know, of when COVID was really strong. Today, globally, we are eighty point eighty one percent actually right now in real life in person, and nineteen percent remote. And there are certain areas like in. Um, areas in Latin America and South America where COVID is particularly, you know, higher in certain places in India where COVID is higher, where it might be as high as 50%. But it, there's, we can look at global heat maps and see, you know, when percentages of COVID in different locations. But right now we're about 80% in person, 20% uh, um, virtual. And that's a, fl a flip from about a year ago, year and a half ago when Delta was so strong, where it was, you know, close to 70, 80%, you know, it was virtual back then. And hybrid, any any um, any kind of records on hybrid? Sure. So we have many groups that are hybrid groups, meaning they right. have events that are in person and they have events that are uh, virtual. And a good like five to ten percent of groups, including I'm an organizer of a group. My group sometimes holds in person events, sometimes holds virtual events. They have both in person and virtual events. But in terms of an event being a hybrid event, meaning it's both in person and virtual at the same time. We have very few of those because those are really tough to make great experiences. But yeah, many groups, many many groups are doing both, which I love. Okay. So, cool. David, um, it looks like we're entering a rocky period um, for the economy, and especially a rocky period for tech. You know, there's a lot of tech companies that are zombies. You know, 
that looks very unlikely they're ever going to make a profit. And their runway, the idea that they're going to go back to their investors and recapitalize if they use, utilize, is probably they're not going to get a great response. How do you how do you see this? How things are going to pan up, pan out in the next twelve months to two years in general? Sure. Okay, so number one, I'm not an investor in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, fortunately, um, and I, I I continue to not believe that um, that that there's a short term valuation opportunity there. In terms of the economy, um, I think it's you know inflation is a serious problem in the United States, and it's a serious problem globally as well. I think it's more of a problem in the United States than it is in Europe. Uh, because I, um, but it's it's a big issue. I think the oil crisis and and challenges with the increased oil is at prices is is a really complicated issue. I think the war in Russia and Ukraine is going to persist for a longer period of time than anyone's anticipating, and it could be multi year, you know, type of war, which which will obviously impact oil prices, will impact inflation. So, you know, I think that we're also seeing obviously big interest rate increases. Which also, you know, has a negative impact on, on a lot of a lot of companies' valuations um, as interest rates go up. I think a lot of tech companies are going to be going to business. I think you're already seeing an increase in terms of the number of um, of, of terminations by tech companies, whether it's Coinbase that announced 20% of their employees are getting laid off, sure. or yeah. other companies that are laying off employees. I think that'll continue and grow. It's mainly fintech, isn't it? Mainly fintech that are laying yeah. people off. It's it's fintech, but it's money. it's fintech. It's also general tech. Um, and I think the focus is going to be on fundamentals. Like you got to be a profitable business. Meetup has been profitable. Meetup lost eighteen and a half million dollars under WeWork in two thousand nineteen. In two thousand twenty, under the pandemic, we made three million dollars. So we had a twenty two and a half million dollars swing after we divested out of WeWork because of their ownership. And we've been profitable every single quarter of COVID, despite COVID kind of hurting our challenge. Ultimately, leaders need to understand tech leaders and any other leaders that the fundamentals of businesses don't change. You need to be a profitable business. You need to return investment to shareholders in a, in a reasonable period of time, or um, you're not going to sustain. And I think more and more companies are going to get back to those fundamentals. Listen, I lived through the internet 1990s. I, I was at one of the top internet companies called DoubleClick, you know, back in that day. When I, I remember seeing our company go from a $10 price to 200 down to eight, you know, in the span of one year during the internet bubble. We are yeah. not in that same bubble, but we're in a problematic situation and it's going to, it's writing itself right now. And there's more to come. Do you think, let, me, let me tell you, people are investing. You know, I'm talking to, I talk to and get approached by funders pretty much every day. So people are, people are still investing, but they're maybe not investing the hundreds of millions. They're sort of more in the two, three to 10 million uh, investment uh, way, but they, they go there. Sorry, John, just to, just to, mm. you know, the smaller businesses are getting opportunities for funding. That's all I'm, all I'm saying. It's the larger ones that need the, the billion dollars or the seven billions or if they're valued at seven billion and actually they're not they haven't made the, stu the stupid yeah. valuations are going are, are have gone exactly. away and will continue to go away and that's a good thing it's a great but, thing. um but david didn't things really need to be you know i don't none of us got a crystal ball about what's going to happen in the next 18 months two years but the reality is things needed to calm down a bit anyway because they were getting they were getting a bit bonkers anyway, weren't they? Yeah, this is all good. This is all just normal. That's how, this it goes back to hundreds of years with the uh, the tulip crisis. I mean, things get crazy and they settle down to normalcy. And we're just in a settling down to normalcy mode. That's all. Yeah, right, Tio. Cool. Um, I sense, you know, um, where do you see me up? Are there anything... Any possibilities for meetup? You know, I'm not asking you, and you're definitely not going to tell me, you know, deep secrets, but um, are there, is there any bigger vision for meetup? Is there anything where you would like it to be in a couple of years' time that you see that there's some real opportunities for meetup itself or in the space in general? Yeah, absolutely. Right so, 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 um, listen, 100 years ago, was the dual hit of the Spanish flu and World War I, and people wearing masks. And there's not, it's not, it's not uh, a coincidence that the Roaring Twenties, which is what it's referred to in the United States and maybe referred to in the UK as well, came out of that time period. Well, we're in early 2020s now. The Roaring Twenties is going to be happening. It's already starting in 2023, 24, 25. 
people's desperate need to get out and get out of social isolation and do fun things is much greater than it ever has been. People are no longer coming into the offices five days a week, which means that their need for connections and need for people is much greater out of their homes okay. than it ever was. And Meetup can be playing a much, 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 it has been now playing a much greater role in people's near their home communities where they live rather than just where people work. We're always where people live and people work, but it's opening up so many opportunities. The number of people searching for remote work meetup groups is up 300% over just a year ago and up 300% from pre, even more than that from pre-pandemic. So there's tremendous opportunity with the migration of workers from you know offices to home, the need for community, which is even greater, the post-pandemic need for going out and doing things. And there's no reason why we only have 60 million people using Meetup. That should be 600 million people. That should be 6 billion people. And that's what's going to happen in the future. And um, we're investing behind it. We're excited about it. And uh, we're already seeing everyone on our metrics just kind of way up into the right now. It's fun. Right. Um, we're going to wrap up the podcast part of the show. Um, David's agreed to stay on for what we call bonus content. I'm actually going to talk to David about what he brought up about loneliness and about the contradiction of living in a digital communication age, yet you've got loneliness, the feeling of isolation growing. Um, I'll be interested in his thoughts about that. Um, so, David, what's the best way to find out more about you and your thoughts and insights, David? Okay. Um, what I would say is to learn about Meetup, really download our app, iOS, Android, or go on to meetup.com, but I love the app, and just look and you'll find something super interesting that you never would have thought of and just go to an event and you will not regret it. You will not regret meeting a bunch of great people. If you're about me, I would say the best thing to do is because, you know, this book was a passion of my soul. It's called Decide and Conquer, 44 Questions that Make or Break All Leaders. Um, just came out really just a few months ago. You can buy it on Amazon, local bookstore, wherever. And uh, that's a great way to learn about me. Or you go on LinkedIn and, you know, Send me a LinkedIn invite, and hopefully I accept, and we get to know each other and build a relationship too. Yeah. Is it an audio book? Because I'm I've got a bit of dyslexia, so I there is an audio book on Audible, and I've been told it has it has literally I think five out of five stars by every person that's left a review. Doesn't do you people. Uh, do you read it? I... So I don't because I was told my voice is too nasally for oh. it. Um, but but I did pick out the person, and he sounds oh. a lot like me, very youthful and oh. enthusiastic. So he's great. Yeah. We got a lot of good feedback about well, you it. You can't say that about me, can you, Dave? Um, Andrew, um, Andrew, how can people find out more about you? Well, they can find out more about Bertha.ai forward slash Yoast. So we've got, got a little collaboration about that. That's all I'm talking about for the next three or four weeks. We're yeah, really, I've, I've noticed we're that. We're really in shush, shush, I'm talking. We're really enjoying working with Yoast. <laughs> they're great people, honestly. They're, they're real hard workers and they're doing us uh, a, a great uh, service by uh, recommending AI. It's a big deal. Yoast is the biggest SEO plugin out there. So, you know, so I'm pretty great. pleased. I'm so pleased. Uh, um, like I say, David's staying with us. To watch the whole interview, you go over to the WP Tonic YouTube channel, watch the rest of the interview, and please subscribe to the YouTube channel. It helps me, helps the podcast, and it helps the tribe. We'll be back next week with another great guest. We'll see you soon, folks. Bye. See ya. So, um, like I say, on to bonus content. So, and just one second, Jonathan. Yes. Larry, do you have something for me? Larry? Yeah, I'm on a podcast. Okay. Sorry. I heard her knocking at the door. <laughs> All right. Um, so, you, you came up with this because this during the podcast part of the interview about loneliness and it was something I was thinking a couple of months ago because it is a bit of a contradiction but not because I was looking at some of the figures that I didn't know you were going to go put that bit into the podcast but funny enough a few months ago I was looking at some of the figures that I think you've been looking at mm -hmm. and about isolation, people feeling that they're not, and I think there's economical and structural things that have caused that. Um, but then you've got the contradiction of of the internet and being and meet up and other platforms and being able to talk to people. So 
It's an interesting concoction, a brew. Have you got any additional thoughts of why we've got these two contradictions playing at the same time? Yeah, I mean, the reality is that people live in a connected world. We don't believe in eschewing and like, you know, not involving ourselves in the tech world. We're a tech company, but ultimately we're the tech company that gets people off of technology is what we've always said. So you need to be in the world that people are in. And then you want to tell people to really build real connections and you build those in person. Facebook has Facebook groups and Facebook you know, obviously has privacy issues and Facebook uses people's data. But ultimately, the way that people interact with Facebook is it's all digital. And we people are liking each other and they're friending each other. Like all those things, you're not really friends with someone. I mean, maybe, but like more likely you're not becoming friends through just a purely digital type relationship. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's almost like the need for in-person is oftentimes greater because of the disassociation between people because of technology. And that results directly in the loneliness epidemic because so many people on social media are seeing these amazing things that everyone's doing and becoming jealous and, 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 and becoming depressed. They're not doing those amazing things too. It's, it's, it's a serious problem. And it's a, the, the technology is a causative to the loneliness epidemic. It, it's great that because We've just come back from Word. John, Jonathan and I met for the first time in real life uh, a few weeks ago in WordCamp uh, Porto. Uh, still don't like each other, but, you know, that's that's one of the things. But the... Uh, no, <laughs> Excellent, Dave. Oh, well, I don't yeah. mind you. You're gonna be, you could be a bit nasty sometimes, but... One, so of, one, of the things, uh, one of the things that I noticed afterwards, the post-WordCamp or the post-meetup, you know, you've got two, two 3,000 people going to these events is that I can't wait for the next one. I literally can't wait for the next one. I'm going to go to Athens. I'm going to go to US or whatever. How do you, as Meetup, address safety issues with Meetups? Um, uh, is there any kind of um, checking of the, of the Meetup organizers? How do, you, how, do you, how do you approach safety, including, uh, because there was a little bit of controversy after WordCamp where a lot of people got COVID, me included, um, because they didn't enforce the mask policy inside the the building, so how do you how do you protect how do you what are your measures to make sure that people are are protected not not yeah. to make sure but to try and it. make okay so trust and safety is like the number one priority for us like that's like the bottom of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is like trust and safety before you get into any kind of self actualization or community so we have a number of employees that are solely focused on our trust and safety team that are trained in handling these kind of problems. We have actually kicked out not thousands, not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands, possibly even up to a million different people off of our platform for inappropriate type behavior. We turn down revenue constantly. We kick off organizers all the time when people report bad behavior by organizers. If an organizer, for example, says something like, in this group, you're not allowed to wear a mask. Like, no, that's not cool. You cannot say that. You're out. And, yeah, and, and, and we, we are very, we also have a third party technology that's one of our most expensive line item spends called SIFT. What they do is they sift through all messages, all digital messages to see where there's inappropriate content based on different keywords that are used. And if someone does share those, that type of inappropriate content, inappropriate images as well, then they're also kicked out of our platform. And then when it came to COVID, we knew that being safe is one of the most important parts of meetup. Safety is so critical that we created the ability for all organizers to list, is this a mask optional event? Is this a mask required event? Is this a mask mandatory event? Is this outdoor event? Is this internal and in indoor event? And we made it easy for members to then filter and do searches and say, I only want to go to mask required events. I only want to go to outdoor events. So we've done a lot, invested tremendous amounts of dollars in kind of the, the ecosystem to make sure to kick out, you know, poor, poor, inappropriate players. Now, does that mean it's perfect? Far from it. It can't be because anyone could act in an inappropriate way and just show up and do something that's inappropriate. Our key is that we capture it quickly. We take action very fast and the person never comes back again. Cool. Can I, so um... being a free, I've got, just got one more quick question. Being a free at point of contact because you you know we i can set up a meetup for free uh, actually not... to be a meetup organizer you have to pay to be a subscriber you could show up to a meetup event for free though right okay so 
how much does it cost? Because there's no you you've it's made that decision to not it's, have pricing yeah. visible. It, no, price invisible. Um, you could go online on our site and you'll see the price immediately. It's it's oh, roughly okay. twenty dollars a month to All right, cool. uh, to be a meetup organizer. Um, cool. Just to finish off, one final question. It's going to be a slight biggie, but I'm interested in your thoughts about this. Sure. It's a bit linked to what we we said in the bonus content about people feeling isolated. There seems to be a, a large group of people in America and Europe in most countries that feel they're not part of the gravy chain. They they're excluded. There's no their dis, their loneliness seems to be linked to despair about and then they turn to drugs, alcohol, extreme political views, religious views. They they it's a term called aminous. They um, feel that there's nothing in their life and they feel excluded. So then they turn to those that seem to offer them. Is there any way that a, a modern capitalist country can deal with that? Or it, are we down a path where only the extremists can offer any kind of solution? I mean, I'm definitely an optimist, so I definitely do not think that we're down that path. Um, I think it comes down to leadership is the bottom line. And um, a, a leader that is able to galvanize the middle and not just the extremes of either kind of political party, social party, et cetera. And there are leaders that can do it. It's not as though it's impossible for a leader to be able to galvanize, you know, larger swaths of different parts of different countries. Um that person will be able to unite us. Do we have that leader in the United States? I don't know. Do we have a leader in, in the UK or, or different countries in Europe? Not, not sure, but there are historically amazing leaders that have been able to accomplish that. And there will be leaders that can accomplish that in the future. And uh, I have confidence that that's going to happen. Just like in businesses, success comes from who the leadership of a, of a company is. In, in terms of a country, success will come from leadership as well. And um, we are going to get there. I am confident we're going to get there with the right people um, that, that know how to um, work the system and also inspire. But do you, just people. to finish off, but do you think that a, a lot of people, because, you know, you look at the death rate that of male adults in the U.S. and it's gone up considerably, you know, the actual... Um, life expectancy in North America has declined over the past couple of years, which is normally a very alarming sign mm -hmm. of a society that's got some deep problems. That's really one of the triggers of most scientists. It's a really alarming trip sign. Yeah, but if you, if you yeah, but if you eliminate COVID deaths from that that statistic, COVID deaths is the thing that's contributing the most towards the decline of. Of, of life expectancy in the United States. In fact, if you eliminate it, then 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 for in the entire time period until COVID, it was con it was consistently increasing. And as COVID is hopefully getting under more control, it'll increase back to pre-COVID levels. And as more medicines are improving cancer, um, heart, and other other type diseases, it will only continue to grow. We took a little bit of a bump, but it'll it'll quality of life and life expectancy will only grow in the U.S., the U.K., and really around the world. Uh, I'm I'm certain of that. Right, you're, you're that. definitely an optimist, and I love I I love the fact I found the pricing sixteen forty nine a month. So that's there great. You, you tried you tried harder, so you encouraged him. Don't <laughs> Andrew, you got to do it. That's it. Our, Good uh, deal. It's been. I a, used to be a web developer, believe it, it or not. It's been a pleasure talking to you, David. We're going to end the thing. Hopefully, at some time later on in the year, you might consider coming back. I think it's been a great discussion. We're going to end it now, Tribe. David's got things to do, obviously. We'll be back next week with another great guest. We'll see you soon. Bye. Cheers, everyone.